Good morning. Can you hear me? I tend to fade a little bit, so if that happens, give me the high sign. Uh, I have to wander a little bit. I have trouble if I'm stuck to a podium. So anyway, um, so today, as Mike alluded to, we're going to ask most of you, the fellows, to step out of your comfort zone, um, move away from learning about the science of medicine and what you're going to do to more the business aspects of how do you actually operate uh, in this environment. Uh, the CSRO has given me license for the last several years to come in and sort of give an opinion piece on where I think we are as an industry. So that's what I'm going to do. State of rheumatology, we look at this industry from sort of the 30,000 foot level. So sit back, relax, don't take notes. Uh, a lot of this is opinion. Uh, there are a few facts in here, and uh, we'll go. So the way I like to approach this um, is in three sections, not necessarily in sequence. But we're going to talk about rheumatology as an industry, if you can put brackets around it, through his some history and perspectives. We're going to talk about some durable concepts of operating in a service business, which we're all in. And then we're going to talk about where we are and what do we do going forward. And we're we'll talking about what a market failure looks like and how do you correct something like that. So if an industry analyst were to look at rheumatology as an industry or any other industry where he's trying to you know, advise somebody, an, an entrepreneur, whether this is a good place to go or whether an investor wants to make a bet on the industry, there's certain key things that he always wants to know. And the big areas is that he wants to know about the, the um, maturity of the industry. And he usually can determine that by their uh, professional associations. Uh, and uh, he wants to know, is there new science and technology coming forth? Because if there's no new technology, it's probably a dying industry. He wants to know about the market. Is it a growing market? Is it a contracting market? And he wants to know about the players. Who are the industry rivals who are participating, and how do they interact with each other for their benefit and for the benefit of their consumers? So when he looks at rheumatology, he sees that we've got the ACR and ULR. We've got some strong scientific and educational organizations. We've got advocative organizations like the CSRO here, the Arthritis Foundation, NORM, and so forth. And when he looks at our scientific advances, that's great. Um, Many of us in the room who will be speaking to you have had two careers. We've had the pre-technology career and the technology career. As we've seen all these new drugs that we have, uh, all the new diagnostics we have, we've really got a lot of uh, advances coming at us. Our market is large and expanding. And it's not just from the population. I mean, when I started, population in the US is about 245 million. Now we're up to some 325 million. We've apparently succeeded at teaching primary care to refer rheumatic disease to us early. So the result of that is this large and burgeoning burden of disease that we have to manage. So our market looks great. But when the analyst looks at the players, he notices first that this is a very small industry. There's only four or 5,000 of us actively participating. And we're fragmented. There's like no big leaders like a Coke or a Pepsi in the industry to sort of move the ball. Um, so the, the most troubling thing he notices is that there's a decreasing number of rheumatologists relative to that demand. And he wants to know if this is all good on all these aspects, why are we seeing a decrease? And you know, his thinking is reinforced by um, this workforce study from the American College of Rheumatology back from 2006. The ACR has done workforce studies periodically about every 10 years. And, We've learned a lot through them. So this workforce study projected that between 2005 and 2025, we we're going to see, based upon current production of rheumatologists, about a 1.2% increase. And at the same time, the demand was going to increase by 46%. Uh, that was troubling. And the analyst wants to know, well, what's characteristic of the players that are there? I mean, what drives them into rheumatology, and why do they stay? And we've seen the surveys. We all like the intellectual stimulation of immunology and these diverse diseases that we manage. We're considered intellectual, and we have a respect from our colleagues. We like that. 
We have a pretty good lifestyle. We don't have to be running into the hospital for emergencies at night. And we get to have long-term relationships with our patients. And many of us prize that uh, almost beyond anything else. We just talked about all the exciting new therapies that we're all aware of. But when it comes to income, the analyst says, well, therein lies the rub. And he quickly can see that it's an issue of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the situation where a company has a certain amount of capital. They have a variety of options that they can choose to invest that capital. And they not only determine what's the best bet, but they determine what they're going to lose by not choosing others. And that's what that what you lose is opportunity cost. And it's easy to see that in rheumatology if you look at any survey of physician incomes. This is Medscape, but across the board, you'll see that rheumatology tends to fly around the lower third of the pack with the orthopedists and the derms, uh, you know, the road to riches all at the top. Um, and unfortunately, if you look at rheumatology, you're not, not getting a whole lot of return on that investment of a couple more years of training. So that's opportunity cost. If we look at practice or life satisfaction, we've seen this bar go up and down. In 2012, Medscape found that rheumatologists were the happiest practitioners. And in 2016, we were the unhappiest. We've seen that fluctuate. You know, <laughs> a couple of years ago, the, the surveys showed that um, Rheumatologists were generally happy, but they weren't happy with their income. They would do medicine again, but they wouldn't do rheumatology again. This year's survey said that it's nice. Most of us would choose, 83% would choose medicine again. 79% of us would choose rheumatology again. But there is a, a happiness factor still at play here, because if you think about burnout among physicians is around an average, what, 52% now? I mean, we've scored at 54%, and that's that cynicism, emotional exhaustion, and loss of personal accomplishment that uh, we're susceptible to. So jet forward to, from 2006 to 2015, our latest ACR workforce study, which shows that even with the help of some 400 um, nurse practitioners and PAs, and I'll refer to them as APCs, advanced practice clinicians, with 400 of them, we still have about 5,400 people working in rheumatology, but based upon projections of our training programs, we're going to see this slide down to more like 3,900 by 2030. So there was just recently published online a deeper dive into this data by the Committee on the Workforce. And what they determined, uh, first off, we knew that there is an overall 31% decrease in manpower that's going to take place by 2030 whereas the demand is going to go up by 138%. Right now, we're at a deficit of 700 rheumatologists based upon demand. And by 2030, we're going to be at a deficit of 4,100, which is about the number of rheumatologists we have now. So that's a problem. So the fellows here have got to be thinking, what have you guys been doing? You saw this in 2006. It's 2015. It's gotten worse. All right, so I have no excuses, but a lot, of, a lot of things have been done. In academics, our academic colleagues have worked hard to get students interested in rheumatology, and we've seen some benefit from that. We've seen 2012 to 2016, the number of programs has ticked back up to 113. Applicants are up, positions available are up, total positions 454, and we expect to churn out 215 new shiny rheumatologists each year. This is good. It still represents a bottleneck, as you can appreciate. So there are lots of forces working against the workforce, not just the opportunity cost, which causes our fellowship programs not to fill because people see the big dollars elsewhere, even though they might naturally be attracted to rheumatology. But this is the big one. Uh, me and Herb and a bunch of us, 50% of us are going to be retiring over the next 15 years. That's the baby boom generation. All this old white guys who came in in the 80s, okay? We're going. And it's a big bump, and that's what's making a lot of difference. In addition, over the last couple of decades, the number of international medical graduates that enter our programs has fluctuated. In the late 90s, it was two-thirds international. 
we got it back to where it was one third, and now it's crept back up to, in 2016, entering fellows 60% with international medical graduates. The problem with that is even at the low end, by self-reporting, 17% are going to have to leave the country. It's probably going to be higher than that. So that's a factor. There's a gender factor. Right now, it's mostly 60, 40 men in rheumatology. In the training programs, it's the opposite. And by 2030, it's going to be 60, 40 women. Why is that important? Because women have better things to do with their lives. They raise families. They organize. They do lots of other things. And statistically, they spend fewer hours a week in the office, and they spend fewer years in a career. So that has an impact. And the last thing is there's this thing called millennial ascendancy. Uh, doesn't that sound great? You know, the millennials are different from us old white guys from the 80s. They want a better life balance. They want to, they're not crazy about making all that money. They want the time they spend at work to be a meaningful experience, not, not just drudgery and, and slugging through. And so that will have an effect on the workforce. So it's illustrated in this deeper dive that was just published a couple of weeks ago by the committee in which they factored in all of those elements. And they realized that it's, not 200, it's 215 new rheumatologists, but it's only 170 full-time equivalents in practice. And if you match that up over the next 9, 10 years, over the people projecting their own retirement, you can see the difference. We can see why that, that curve of, of rheumatologists is plummeting. So. Talk to you about what the academic physicians have been doing. What have we been doing in private practice? Well, there's been lots of responses in private practice to improve our attraction to rheumatology. And there's, the way we've addressed this challenge in the new millennium is I think most of the experienced guys in the room would say that there's two guiding principles um, for promoting the, the health of our profession. And the first is this, and this has been endorsed by the ACR over and over in their position papers. And that's the greatest risk to the quality of care of a patient with rheumatic disease is the unavailability of a rheumatologist. Right? I think you'd all agree with that. And it follows that private practice rheumatologists must optimize their business practices to optimize profitability so that we can compete for new blood. We've got to reduce that opportunity cost. And that's what we've been working at. And that's the only way we're going to hope to meet the demand. So we've seen a lot of uh, responses. Um, just briefly, there's a couple of organizations, one called US Rheumatology, one called US Rheumatology Network. These are uh, largely organizations that have been capitalized by some big supply companies that can make available to small rheumatology practices a palette of uh, business services to help optimize your cash flow cycle, your contracting, and so forth. And that's one way to go. There's some other exercises going on. There's a, a multi-state group called American Arthritis and Rheumatology Associates, several states operating under a single federal tax ID. They have more or less an external um, management company called BenCare. And we're seeing how that experiment is going. A couple of others, ours in Arizona, we're a one-state organization. We've grown organically over time. We cover the state now. All shareholders are practicing rheumatologists. We have integrated business units, a physician and a couple of nurse practitioners or PAs. And all of our ancillary services are integrated, are integrated units that have to stand on their own. There's another group called Articularis that's similar to us. They operate across two states, fully rheumatology owned. They have uh, created along with uh, supply company called Cardinal, a nice rheumatoid arthritis pathway. And using that, they've been able to leverage some better contracts and better drug rebates than most of us. So there are efforts. So I want to take a few minutes. And this is lots of opinion you're going to hear. But I think it resonates well with a lot of my colleagues. So I'm going to go over it again about how we think about where we are and how we got here and what we need to do. There's this thing called the five forces of, in of industry. Um, it's by a guy named Michael Porter at the Harvard Business School. He's an old guy. He's still there. He wrote this tome in 1980 called uh, Competitive Strategy. And 
it's useful to apply to almost any industry. If you look at each factor, each of the forces, you can kind of understand the dynamics. So it works like this. In the center is the industry rivals, the participants. That's like us. Um, the threat of new entrants, who's coming in to knock you out. Threat of substitutes, who's bringing other goods or services that will diminish your power. What's the bargaining power you have with your suppliers and what's the bargaining power you have with your buyers, okay? Lots of people like to use this model to talk about the soft drink industry. You got Coke and Pepsi and Snapple and some other players and the dynamics are interesting. You can apply that to any industry. If we put brackets around rheumatology and apply this, what's it look like? So we're the industry rivals and we're this small group of fragmented companies, right? No Cokes, no Pepsis, no one really driving the trends in the industry yet. That may be changing as we speak. The threat of new entrants, the barriers to entry are high. You've got to go to college, medical school, residency, fellowship, got to get board certified to be a responsible player, right? So barriers to the entry are high. Threat of substitutes, back in the day when we shifted from indemnity insurance to managed care, we thought that this gatekeeper effect was going to cause the primary care docs, orthopedists, homeopaths, they were all going to hang on to rheumatology and not refer to us. And that had a dent on our training programs at the time. But it didn't happen. Everybody holds rheumatology at arm's length because it's complex, it's nuanced, our tests are vague, our images are vague. Uh, you know, you really got to love this stuff to be good at it. And you do get good at it and you make a difference. But everybody else is terrified of it. You, you'll see when you start getting consults on what we're thinking. Anyway, so the threat of substitutes is low. We have limited bargaining power against our suppliers. We do get together in group purchasing organizations, buy in bulk so we can drive down prices. But over here, the bargaining power of the buyers is really wherein lies the rub. Because you think about where are our major buyers right now? They are government, Medicare, Medicaid, military, VA, whatever. And it's managed care. And now managed care, as you understand, just like government, they wrap their arms around corporations and all of their people, and they supply the company with a lower price insurance plan for their employees. And in return, they get to set a fee schedule that the physicians who want to access those patients have to agree to, just like government. So they control the pricing. And how does this work? Well, our analyst goes back and says, well, does the law of supply and demand work here? Is it working? And you know this law. If, you, if the demand curve is proceeding to the right and the supply curve is receding to the left, this intersection is the price point. It should rise. It should rise here. And all of us working through the 90s saw that that didn't happen. We were seeing more and more patients. We were in more demand. But our prices were kept level because of these constraints. So he says, you know, law of supply and demand isn't working the way it should here, so there must be distortions. And I think most of us would agree that there are two main distortions, or there have been, in rheumatology. One is the payers. We've talked about government managed care. There's this quirky thing in our antitrust laws that allows insurance companies to collude on the fee schedules they're going to offer. It's against the law for us to collude on price. You could go to jail if you get together with the rheumatologists in your community and say, let's not accept anything less than this. That's illegal. And there's no collusion. No collusion. <laughs> um, and we already talked about this cognitive procedural discrepancy that's been there forever in American medicine, where you get paid more to cut, sew, and read images rather than to sit down with a patient, work through a treatment program. The other major distortion is unfortunately us. That's the inconvenient truth that rheumatologists don't tend to be entrepreneurial. Not like orthopedists and cardiothoracic surgeons and dermatologists. We're more cerebral. We like the science. We like to apply the science. We don't want to get involved with business. And through the late 90s and early 2000s, the coders here can tell you that rheumatologists were notoriously bad about undercoding for their services. We wanted to fly under the radar so we wouldn't get kicked off the health plans. That was a big problem. The ACR and Norm and all, a lot of other people that you're going to hear from today have helped to rectify that. But that's 
we've been uh, a problem for ourselves. So the analyst comes back and say, you know, what we're looking at here is a market failure from a series of distortions. A market failure is a situation where there is a demand for a public good, but the market isn't supplying that demand. And we usually think of that occurring, say, in the arts or education or the environment, where there's, you know, there's a public demand for a public good and it's not being met, and so government has to step in, uh, altruism has to step in, you know, big corporations through their uh, corporate social responsibility, you know, create funds to, to do these things. That's not available to us in rheumatology yet, but we've talked about how constrained pricing has created a market failure. We've got a constrained labor market. Look at all the international medical graduates in our programs. Um, most of them, or at least a good portion of them, have to leave. There's bottlenecks throughout the educational situation. College is too expensive. Medical school is too expensive. If you go to Mexico or the Caribbean and you get a better price on your education, now you're confronted with finding a PGY1 position back in the US. We hardly have enough PGY1 positions for domestic graduates. So if you can't get a PGY1, you can't get an in, a residency, you can't get a fellowship, you can't be a rheumatologist. So that's a constraint. The other thing is this lasting social ambivalence that you all know that we have about medical, or medical care in the US. Is it a right or is it a privilege? Should it be treated as infrastructure, like our highways, like our public school system, like the power grid? Uh, or is it just a free market thing? If you got the cash, you can go get medical care. If you don't, you're out of luck. Um, this is still playing out. You know, and it, it becomes very personal at some point. We're used to thinking of doctor-patient relationships as being a covenant relationship. You know, I'm going to do the best, and the patient trusts that I'm going to do the best in their best interest. But now there's another shift that's shifting more out of pocket cost to your patients. Their co-pays and their deductibles are higher. So when they come into the room, the dollar comes in with them. And the dynamic many physicians have told me is that now a patient has the attitude, well, I'm paying a lot for this, and I'm feeling it. And because I'm feeling it, I expect in this relationship, I expect positive results. If I don't see positive results, then somehow, doctor, you're in breach of contract. And that creates a lot of the cynicism that leads to burnout. And it's cynicism on both the patient side and the physician side. So I want to shift just for a minute to talk about just operationally how we can think about improving our practices. Um, and it's useful to conceptualize or compartmentalize. You have an internal environment, what goes inside your walls, and the external environment, what goes on outside your walls. In the inside, in the internal environment, you can use this so-called services marketing triangle. And it works like this. You're the company, your patients are your customers, and then you have internal customers, your staff members. Pretty simple. So what you're going to do is you're going to set a promise to your customers about what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. You're going to give them the best rheumatology care they can get, but you're not going to do all their internal medicine. You're not going to be running into the ER at night, um, that kind of thing. And then you enable the promise by letting your staff know what the promise is and how you want it delivered. And this is called your internal marketing. And this is incredibly important. You've got, to employ, you've got to pay your staff right. It's a continuous process. But what that does is enable you to deliver on the promise. And the mistakes get made over here by creating expectations that you can't or don't plan to meet. And on the other side, by not building your internal customer. Very simple uh, concept, but incredibly important. When we look at the external environment, I think most of my colleagues would agree it falls into four categories. The first being our contracts, what we get paid for our evaluation and management. And although I talked about there's these fee schedules we have to agree to, there is some ability to adjust that, maybe often up to 20%. And there's some guys here who have done fabulous jobs at moving the ball by demonstrating the strengths in their organizations to the payers. Um, vertical and horizontal integration refers to adding services, and we'll talk about that more in just a minute. We have functional relationships with other entities in our exchange network. 
whether it be a hospital, whether it be our referral base, whether it be the other specialists we refer to and they refer to us, the legal and regulatory entities that we have to satisfy because they all affect our bottom line. And lastly is what we're doing today, cooperating with our colleagues for strength. We're all on the same team here. Even though there's some, maybe some friendly competition in communities, we're all behind the eight ball and we're all trying to move in the same direction. So vertical and horizontal integration is this concept that our core competency is the diagnosis and management of rheumatic disease, right? But in order to execute that mission, we utilize a lot of ancillary services, lab, x-ray, other imaging, um, infusion services, a whole bunch. And if you just look at, the, say, the Medicare dollar, the first 18 to 20 cents goes into your pocket to pay your expenses and your salary and so forth. But your pen drives that other 80 cents. And traditionally, it would drive it outside your walls to other entities who would provide these services and profit from them. So if we're an industry that's contracting because of opportunity cost, it makes sense for us to drive that revenue into our walls rather than out. And that's what most of the successful practices have done, found ways of insourcing many of these activities. And there's a whole variety, we can go through the list later, but that's the basic dynamic. Along this horizontal line, it's just like that five forces of industry. There are some ways to move into or closer to our suppliers by group purchasing organizations, like I mentioned. Some people will buy and own their own big buildings and be the suppliers of their own space. Well, on this side, there have been some practices uh, that I've seen mainly in the Northwest that have done a run around managed care and contracted directly with huge employers like Boeing, Microsoft, Intel, to provide rheumatology services and room, remove the middleman with a premium contract. So that's sort of the thought processes that have gotten us here. In my role in our group, it's been helpful for me over time to kind of look out the window at the larger world and our domestic market and other industries and what pressures are they under for change and you know, how are they responding. You know, sometimes you can pick up signals that are helping. And you know the story. Right now, if you want to put an overarching theme on it, it's technologies versus human adaptability. The technologies seem to be moving faster than our humans and our systems can keep up with them. And it's all about, think about it very simply. How much headache do we have connecting the patient with the drug they need? And you get the sense of what I'm talking about. There's some terms that are rampant out in the business literature. Dislocation is just that idea that um, human adaptability lags behind the technology. Disruption is that term applied to when, for example, when travel with Uber and with Airbnb, where you've got a technology that's disrupting a whole other stable industry, hotels, taxis. And you, know, you, you see this playing out through education, communication. How you get your communication and entertainment is changing so fast, it's really hard to keep up with. Banking and finance. You don't have to get your money from a banking institution anymore. You can go through LendingTree. You can go through crowdsourcing. A lot of people in the world do their banking on their cell phone, particularly throughout Africa. There's changes taking place in power and transmission. We know the story with medical technology. We've seen all the great therapeutics and oncology and, and immunology. Soon we're probably going to see exoskeletons, things that make workers stronger and things that make older people able to move, whereas they were immobile before. It's OK if you get too old and you can't drive anymore because you'll have a self-driving car or you know, Uber to take you wherever you want so you can stay engaged more without having to depend on family and friends. Um, and health apps. Up to now, you know, health apps have been monitoring our calorie output, our vital signs. Even you know, every five minutes, you can get your blood sugar. Uh, there's, there's a shift towards digiceuticals, where you're going to have devices or apps that may work along with drugs or by themselves and do things like um, people go to eat, you know, advise them to make good choices. Uh, if they have ADD, you know, they may get to play a game on their cell phone to calm them down and help them refocus. So those may be more effective than drugs. We'll see. So I think we're going to see this. But um, if you think about healthcare as separate like that, there's the, all these concepts that are coming at us 
really just in the last decade that we're dealing with, population management, where I'm supposed to identify by metrics, you know, my sicker population and pay more attention to them and figure out what to do with the rest. And all the time, the medical legal community is reinforcing that single doctor-patient relationship. So we have to find where's the balance with these dynamics. We have more cost shifting, as I talked about. Um, you know, throughout industry, big data implementation is everything. Uh, and we call it real world evidence. You know, we're so used to getting our knowledge from randomized controlled prospective clinical trials, where you look at the outcomes and you look at the adverse events. And now we see that there's huge data being aggregated from hospital records, uh, death records, pharmacy records, and all this. And who knew? Who knew that omeprazole was correlated with renal failure, was correlated with dementia, was correlated with osteoporosis? We never would have gotten that from a randomized controlled clinical trial. So this real world evidence, I think, is going to drive more of our decision, or at least as much of our decision making as RCTs are driving. We'll talk about physician extenders at the end. Artificial intelligence. I wonder, am I going to be replaced by a robot? Machine learning is picking up speed. And, but I, I don't think so. I think that can happen in other chronic diseases like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, so forth. Ours is a little bit out of that grid. That's why people stiff arm us. They don't want to do our stuff. They want us to do it. Um, but I can imagine intelligent assistance where I might have augmented reality glasses on, patient walks in, you know, facial recognition tells me who the patient is, chart pops up, and in my visual field, I can see what they're on, I can see their allergies, I can vital signs, and we have the discussion. As the discussion goes on, ideas pop out about things we might change to and what they can't ha have because of their allergies. I can see that happening. That would be very, very helpful for the rheumatology community. What really may disrupt us are the gene technologies that are picking up speed. CRIS PR Cas9, where if you can identify somebody who's at ultimate risk for disease, uh, plucking out a gene and replacing it, that would be disruptive. I'm looking forward to that. But right now, look at this. We're still struggling with access versus privacy. The same polemic as you know, security versus uh, privacy. So. And I hesitate to even get into this. If you watch the news, read any business journals at all, you see this dynamic relationship change that's going on in our nation. Insurance companies are buying pharmacies, are buying pharmacy benefit plans, are buying clinics. You've got the CVS Minic clinics. You know, that's starting to disrupt some primary care um, paradigms. I don't think this is going to affect us. Again, it might affect other chronic diseases like management of your hypertension, your hyperlipidemia, even your diabetes. But I don't think it's going to happen here. But it's, it's just crazy because you see companies like Amazon, you know, where you get everything else delivered. They want to do your health care now. They want to not only be your insurer, they want to, you know, be your pharmacist. So, and, you know, they want to be your clinician. So watch this. I'm not sure where it's going to go. I think we may be the last to be run over by something like this, but it's out there. So solving the manpower problem. If you remember that slide where I listed those forces working against the workforce, each one of those problems, there's a potential for a solution. We can reduce the opportunity cost by better managing our practice. And I think we're seeing that. Even though uh, rheumatology is still dead in that third, you know, in the last 10 years, we've all seen increases in income. We can expand our training capacity. We need to do it in underserved areas. You all know that there's kind of a concentration of rheumatologists at the Eastern Seaboard and a whole lot less of us down in the Southwest and in the Midwest. We need to put new training programs in those areas. And you know, I don't, I don't mind seeing the OA and fibromyalgia and so forth in a consult. I like my primary care docs and referring docs to feel secure about they're not missing something. So I'll turn those patients over, but I don't hang on to them, and I think that's one thing we do. We don't need to hang on to the stuff that other people can take care of. If our advocacy organizations are going to lobby for anything, I think it's these next two things, loan repayment plans. You spend as much as on your education, you incur as much debt, 
as people who are going to make predictably two or three times what you are. So we need to push for these repayment programs. In other industries, with re, uh, other industries are pushing for um, immigration reform so that when somebody comes to the U.S. and they work hard and they get a master's degree or a Ph.D. in one of the STEM areas, science, technology, engineering, math, they should have a green card stapled to their diploma, should do this in rheumatology. We need to lobby for that. Our academicians need to continue what they're doing with excellent clinical training, mentoring, and lifelong learning. And we, in private practice, need to bring in the new rheumatologists who are graduating, need to nurture their efficiency right off the bat. We need to nurture their business acumen. And we need to nurture that sense of pride and ownership. Our group now has, I think, 225 employees. We feel good that we've created those jobs. We feel good that we're doing a better job than anybody else that's near us in terms of supplying the demand. Um, so we're doing that. I'm just going to spend the last minute and a half on um, APCs, nurse practitioners and PAs, minding that gap. This may be a lifeline to us, uh, and we need to work at it, and it's not an easy problem. If you look, 25% of the rheumatology practices in the U.S. utilize at least one APC. In the U.S., the ratio of APCs to rheumatologists is 1 to 10. In our company, it's 2 to 1. We've been working at this for some 24 years. And so on average, one rheumatologist has two APCs. Um, and that's made a huge difference. If every practice in the country was like ours, we wouldn't have a manpower problem at this time. Or we'd be meeting the demand while waiting to generate more rheumatologists. There's, there's barriers to this. You have to train these folks. They come out as raw material. Um, and if you carefully select, if you recruit well and you put your training efforts in, it's a win-win. It's Quality of life goes up. Income goes up. Patients are happier. Access to us is so much better. It's good. But now we, we're, we're looking, we're doing our own research on what makes APCs tick and what makes them stick. Oddly enough, those that have been around for a while, they're attracted to the same thing we are. They're attracted to the complexity. They're attracted to the variety of presentations that people have. They love this stuff, and they're mostly attracted to the results. They see really sick patients. We apply you know, high technology, and they get better, and they're hooked. But uh, to make them stick, you've got to fulfill their careers. You've got to develop their careers just like you develop your own. You can't be shoving them off in a corner to see the osteoarthritis and the fibromyalgia. You have to bring them in just like another fellow and train them in, in all the technical nuances that we have to deal with uh, for them to feel like uh, they're professionals, they've got backup, and they've got your respect. So Albert Einstein said in 46, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. We've talked about where we have been in rheumatology, what our opportunity cost problems are, what our manpower problems are. We've talked about a number of solutions. And the solutions look different than what we've been doing the last 40 years as rheumatologists, both in business um, and how we deliver care. So the good thing is, is that you guys are the generation that can handle this, not us old white guys that are moving out. Okay? You guys were born into the digital age. You were born into the biologic age. Many, if not most of you, are transcultural. You're used to adapting. You're used to bring it on. Okay? So you're better equipped than us to do this. And I want to leave you with that final message, what I started out with. You're in the catbird seat. You're getting excellent training. And you're going to have this huge demand, this huge market. You're always going to have a strong job. Do it smart, and you'll very much enjoy your career. It'll be very fruitful and very fulfilling. So I'm going to stop there and see if there's any questions, if there's time. Thank you.